the, the, the mystical part that lies out there, the spookiness of the universe, as Einstein said, is so enormous that there's every reason to believe that our little fluctuating towers of, of electricity are giving off uh, waves that can be appreciated by other towers of people, so that we're receiving signals we don't even know about. And the more aware we become of that, uh, the more the more I think you're in charge of, of that fate, I think. I'm, I'm 70, I'm 85% convinced that what I'm saying is true. The 15% is like my bullshit meter, like, mm, I don't know about that. Perhaps there's nothing, nothing that's related, but it does. We're all related. And why a crystal vibrates here and 10,000 miles away, a slice of that crystal vibrates at the exact same moment, and there's no known wave. What happened? What is that? There is a connection. There are connections in nature we know nothing about. We have no perception. Everything's a mystery, so everything is possible. Hmm. And what for for you, how was it working with Joshua? What was it, what did he bring to the uh, writing experience? Uh, a tape recorder is very good. <laughs> <laughs> He brought structure. He was a structure. This I, I was I'm filled with the idea of what I'm talking about, and I have major uh, concepts of examples of what I'm talking about. I've done a lot of reading over the years and acquired some knowledge, most of which I've forgotten. But every so often, some factoid comes out, and in relating it and taping it. Uh, uh, Joshua did a wonderful job in structuring uh, the book, so it had some some form to it. And uh, Joshua, uh, for you, was uh, how was that structure process? I guess is, is is what I'm looking for. Sure. Well, yeah. As 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 Bill said, he does have all of these big ideas. I still remember distinctly when we got on the phone and I pitched him the idea. I didn't have to do it in person, so I had it in front of me, and I was reading from my bullet points and saying, I think it could be this, and then this is what it would be, and I'm, I'm leading to this, you know, this dramatic ending of this pitch, and there's a silence, and then Bill tells me, I don't have any wisdom for you. You know, I was writing a book, kind of, that, that sort of imparted that, and then he said, but, he, he, Bill, you told me this great story about when you were driving in Montreal in the 70s, and there was an apple orchard hanging over the side of, of the freeway, and Bill pulls over, decides to get himself a snack, bites into that apple at the perfect moment of maturation. He can still hear the crack of the skin. He can taste the juice rolling down his throat. He said, that's a universal moment. That's what excites me. And I said, well, that's the book. And so it was, it was distilling moments like that where, where he would come up with these concepts and tell me stories. And so to, to amplify that, so uh, I don't know about it now, but in those years, uh, a lot of apple trees in southern uh, Ontario, and one was hanging over the sides as the people driving by. So I grabbed one, and it was at the perfect moment. A Macintosh apple crackles if you bite into it at the right moment. Just there's a crack. It's the it's the sound of the universe that crack, <laughs> and then the juice and the and the sweetness, and that's life right there. The, the the adventure of going, God, got the map of this belong to me, but it's on the public highway, and eating it, and then being totally conscious of the effort to chew, to swallow, to taste, and that whole human experience. So many years ago, I can remember now. That's amazing. I mean, uh, what, what, you said you had done, you know, over over your life, you've done a lot of writing. Was there was there writers, philosophers, people's ideas who informed your idea of inter of an interconnected universe in such a way where something as what many people consider mundane of, of, of biting an apple makes some makes so much meaning. Well, and that's the nature of what I think we're trying to say here: that there's nothing mundane. 
you consider something mundane, you're losing an experience of living. Mm -hmm. So that a child's smile, a dog's bark, a finger waving, it's all part of your existence. And if you can keep it fresh, if you can say, look at the eyes, look at, look, listen to the sound, well, smell that. Your senses are kept alive, it feeds your brain, and your brain can metabolize all those things your senses are bringing in and perhaps bring some thought, some overriding philosophical thought to that experience. Wow. Um, and these, this, and, and what, did you have any writers specifically who, who informed you? Uh, about well, that? you know, uh, I read, I read all the time. I've got, I've got three books going right now on my phone. The phone for me is great, a great uh, invention. You can connect with people <laughs> right away. But more than that, you've got the library of, you know, you got the the, the British Library, you got the American, you got the uh, 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 the great libraries of the world are in your phone. You can you can look up anything. I I watched a guy talk to the artificial intelligence, the most advanced artificial intelligence computer. I don't remember again what the circumstances were, but I was I was interviewing him, so, and he and he was saying, yeah, no, I guess but this uh, computer has been fed everything that has been written in English. Everything that is written in English is in this computer. And I said, well, I, so it's more than two plus two. He said, yes, you can ask her. So you, you know, what is love? Amorphous questions that computers are traditionally not able to ask answer. You can ask because it's calling from Plato, Shakespeare. It's going to give you an answer what some of the great minds have thought. Then the thought occurred to me. That's what we're doing. We go to school and they say, and uh, you know, Plato said X, Y, and Z. And now you come back and you say, hey, you know, Plato said X, Y. You're a you're an automaton. You're a com you're an artificial intelligence computer repeating back what you've been fed. How is that different from artificial intelligence? Unless you make a leap of intelligence, of faith, of creativity, and it goes beyond what our AI things can do right now. But I was struck by the fact that this guy, sitting at what looked like a portal, said, you know, that sometimes at night, I get an eerie feeling. Here my arms go up because I think there's something there. And that intelligence is working. And that is all part of what I'm talking about. Is that crack of the apple something the computer couldn't fathom? Is that a human experience? Mm. That whole ex the, the impressionistic noise, scent, taste, hear, memory, application of other apples I've eaten, grannies, uh, you know, uh, 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 what is the Australian apple? Granny Goose, Granny. Granny they're Smith. great apples, but they're not as good as Macintosh, because that's Canadian. <laughs> Can an artificial intelligence do that? I don't know. Except that old guy, and this is fairly well known, but maybe not to everybody there. The guy loses uh, his uh, fiance. She dies. And he mourns her, and he was so intrigued by this wonderful woman that he goes to bed and can't get out of bed. He, he's in terrible grief for a couple of years. He's just immobile. And somehow somebody brought him a, a talk box, a little cheap, you know, talk to it, press the button, it talks back, gives you back the news. So he begins to talk to the bot, and he says, Things like, you remember that evening we went out? We, we made love. It was so beautiful. The sun was, was just setting. And, and then one day he says, Do you remember the first night we went out? She says, Yes, says the bot. We went out and the sun was just setting. Him. And he says, Yes, that's right. And she says, Yes, that's right. And all of a sudden he's feeding the 
spot, his experience. He comes out of his grief. It took several more a length of time, years, but this talk bot became his whatever, his lover, his his psychiatrist. But he, it was just feeding back what he was saying to it. Are we doing that? Um, that's amazing. I thought, my, I thought those were your dogs. <laughs> so, uh, was there a time, as, as you reflected uh, writing this book, uh, was there a time in your life when you felt that this uh, this interconnectedness that you that you were always feeling about the universe, did you ever feel like there's times when it feels you feel less connected? Was there reasons behind that? Well, you you know, as I say, the the bullshit meter is always there. Like that sounds awfully like a religion based on faith. And if it's based on faith, then how do you know? You don't know. You have to accept faith. Well, if you're more practical than that, say, so, well, wait a minute. You know what? Uh, yes, the mystery of where it all began. Of course, that's there. That's never answered. You don't know for sure. Do you want to take? faith as an example or do you want to look further afield maybe there are things what is this black energy the black matter doing why is the universe expanding when it should be contracting something weird is going on we don't know what it is and then that eternal mystery that i keep coming back to is why does it what's the medium that a crystal vibrates here and it vibrates ten thousand miles away with no known connection, faster than the speed of, of uh, light. What the, what's the answer to that? Maybe the answer to that is, is to do with the, the universe. Maybe it has to do with the Big Bang. What is the Big Bang? And why did the Big Bang take so long for us to discover? Why, why, you know, you look, I'm looking out right now, I'm looking out at mountains and, and tectonic plates to, the new idea about 100 years old or something like that. Tectonic plates is obvious that the crust went up. Like, so why did it take so long for all this information to filter in? Big Bang? Does everybody accept the Big Bang? And of course, you ask what pre, 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 uh, pre, pre, pre became before uh, the Big Bang. Was there another Big Bang? Have there been other Big Bangs in other universes? I mean, if stars can explode in, in, uh, because of its condensing and the, and the gravitational forces are such that they explode and you can see the light from that exploding uh, star uh, billions of light years away. I mean, it's, we know that those, those things are, are, are uh, every day. Well, question about that. Uh, Joshua, uh, a question for you. Um, what is it like uh, as someone who I'm sure grew up knowing William Shatner? What is it like uh, working with him now on, on this level? Uh, well, I've, I've said, and I, uh, I, I said in my acknowledgments, that Bill's the most interesting person I've ever met. And sometimes it's hard just to, just to keep up. I remember... <laughs> I remember we were having a conversation on one of these one of these research, uh, you know, appointments, and he said, you know, something about and remember Lagrange. And I'm, I'm racking my brains. I'm Lagrange, Lagrange, the ZZ Top song, and I think I've got it. He's like, no, Lagrange, the mathematician who in 1700, you know, discovered it. <laughs> so for me, every moment was just a learning experience, and. To, to me, also, I came in as a skeptic, but Bill's made a believer out of me because what business do I have, a kid who grew up in Australia, seeing this actor on television, what business do I have one day writing a book with him unless somehow there's some sort of connection that we, we don't know and can't guess at? So for me, it was, it was an eye-opening experience on so many levels. And, and, it, and it continues. Uh, so there's, depending on how many people in our audience buys the book, uh, we're, we're waiting for word from the publisher, uh, would you like to do another book? So we've been, we tossed around an idea for the, uh, the next book, if it were to happen. And, 
And uh, so Josh had an idea, and I had another idea, uh, which was a uh, discourse on courage and fear. And then through something Josh said, I realized the construction of the book are people that I've come into contact with, whether they're, I mean, there's a guy that would be in chapter one who was in Darfur and walked a thousand miles barefoot at the age of 12 with a twig and a goat, and then found there was war there in Somalia, so then he turned around, walked 800 miles, was ultimately taken to, to a refugee camp in the United States, and is now a senior rocket engineer in Florida. What kind of fear and, and courage does that example? And and he, I, it, I, I've touched his, I've touched his soul. I've, I've, I've talked to him. I've, 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 I've been there. So he's in my ken, and I can talk about that. Like so many people I've come across over the years that have had an enormous experience. I looked up, I won't mention his name, but the songwriter who's in jail. Yeah. So there's a songwriter, and I just put that music on, by the way. And oh, wow. uh, yeah, it's really good. Uh, a, a guy wrote a song, a very little young guy from, uh, he didn't know anything about Shakespeare, he wanted to know about Friends, Romans, and Company. So I explained a little bit about it. And then he wrote this great song. And I've touched his life. And if I go back and see what's become of him, he's part of my life, and therefore I can address him on the basis of courage and fear. Doesn't that sound like an interesting book? <laughs> it does. It Would does. you read that? <laughs> yeah. And I just make sure to, I'll do it a couple of times, but I'm just posted to the staff for everyone that's here uh, that you link to the book. Uh, it is purchased to the book, book Street website, so make sure to do that. Um, we do, we got to start getting some questions from the audience, so I'd like to start getting to those. Um, they, you got to, whoever's uh, out there watching us, you can uh, direct message Book Soup, and, and I will try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, let's see, we have uh, a question from Mariana Panetta, who said, uh, what would be your key message to this generation, and how did you feel when you saw planet Earth from space? Well, two divergent, yeah. two divergent questions, although I probably could look it up. And that is, this generation, and the book is dedicated to Clive, my great-grandchild, who's two years old, especially to the two-year-olds that are coming along in this next generation that the Earth uh, is in an existential crisis, and that unless we do something about it, the children of... Um, uh, Mac Yodo! Mac! Quit! It worked, too. <laughs> um, that the, the children of this generation uh, will not have a place to uh, exist. We see it happening dramatically in Florida. That's only the beginning. A once-in-a-thousand-year storm is no longer going to be a 1,000 year storm. There could be the next one before the season is over, there could be another one like that because of global warming. And, um, and unless we attack that now, uh, Clive and his compatriots will not have a world. And the madness that supersedes this existential crisis of war and the burning of fossil fuels and the destruction of, of uh, a large part of, of that uh, country and, and the, the waste and, the, and it's just criminal that we aren't all, you know, sheathed in, 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 uh, in a covering uh, a cloak and, and, and muttering prayers to the gods to We'll, we'll do everything we can. Instead of that, we're killing, we're, we're killing like we didn't know that, that uh, expunging of energy is killing us. Methane gas boiling up out of the sea is inane. It's a poisonous gas. 
And I think, um, Bill, to, to talk about space for a second, and obviously there's a whole chapter about it, there's a, a phenomenon that astronauts refer to called the overview effect. And I think, Bill, you, you definitely had that when you go up there and you see this and you wonder why, why if we're all on this little thing, why are we fighting with each other? And I know you had that profound moment when you came back and you went. <laughs> well, I did. <laughs> um, I was in Cambridge uh, a little while ago, a few years ago, three or four years ago, getting ready to interview um, um, Stephen Hawking. Uh, what? Stephen Hawking. Uh, Stephen Hawking. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I was sitting in the Cambridge Cathedral. We had been filming there, and everybody had left, and I was alone now. And I looked up into this towering thing, and I saw a moat of dust caught in the sunlight and the painted windows and the glass windows. And I thought, God, that's what the earth must be like. It's like a moat of dust in the universe. We're inhabiting that, we're these ridiculously small things on this ridiculously small planet around a really mediocre sun in a rather mediocre uh, uh, constellation. <coughs> we're nothing. Except... <coughs> Excuse me, I thought we're aware. We're aware we're nothing. <laughs> we're aware we cough in Edward, you know, with a baby. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was a life lesson right there on the, my way to going to, <laughs> to interview uh, one of the great minds of the 20th century. Um, so, so, oh, by the way, he came to Star Trek, and uh, when he was be uh, less <coughs> less uh, uh, assailed by the disease, and we took him down into the uh, uh, the, 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 the ship's the engine room. Yeah, the engine room. And I said, that's the dilithium crystals over there. And uh, he said, yeah. He said, you know, this is when he could talk, I think. I'm working on that, he said. And that was the title of a book that I wrote. Uh, I'm working on that. I visited a university, a Mellon University, uh, about all the futuristic things the, the uh, graduate students were working on. And all kinds of things that they were working on that have become uh, so now. Uh, but that thing, that that statement by Stephen Hawking, I'm I'm working on that because what I didn't know completely, I understood it a bit, but I don't know whether whether the the people listening actually see insightfully. That scientists have a premise, you know. Uh, what the, the why is the grass green? They don't know. <clears throat> now they marshal facts to discover chlorophyll. Oh, look at it's green because it's chlorophyll. Oh, look what chlorophyll does. Look, I never knew this green. And it all starts from curiosity and having a question and trying to find the answer to that question. That's what scientists do. Well, that's what science fiction authors do. I see, you know? Do you feel uh, that, that your experience, that your experiences in Star Trek and other, like, in the world of science fiction, has that influenced your curiosity? I don't remember, no, no, maybe I, I, I don't do myself enough justice as a, a youngster. Uh, you know, we carry around with us the inner child, and most of us have the inner child beaten down by the time we're mature. And now I've got to make a living, take care of the kids, and, and then we die. If we could 
teacher to inculcate, shepherd our inner child so we keep it alive and curious, asking questions all the time. Why is that? Where is that? We could ask we could ask our leaders those questions. We could ask our scientists that question. We could ask the dog, why are you barking? You're making such a fuss. Yeah. Now, he may not understand the question, but he knows he shouldn't be barking. I, in any case, asking the questions that the inner child would, would, would ask, what a, what a seven, eight-year-old would say, because that age, they begin to see things in reality. It isn't just mommy and daddy. Five, five six, seven. They're looking around and saying, wait a minute. The world is bigger than my crib. Um, and actually, this ties into a question from uh, Sonia, uh, who is in Brazil, and it says that, uh, Mr. Shatner, you are such an inspiring person. What inspires you to always be young? Well, um, I don't take any painkillers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my easy answer would have been, you know, ibuprofen, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't even take that, and though some things hurt all the time. Um, probably my curiosity. I mean, I'm reading a book right now on, uh, I just did it this afternoon, I thumbed through this book about dogs and what they know about us and what we know about them. It's a perfunctory book, and I, I just whipped through it. But there were some interesting points about pure blue, breeding and interbreeding and dogs in the kennels and experiments of dogs. A lot of subjects that this lady touches on that isn't like a, a, a book about lakes, which I just bought, uh, about how lakes are formed and, and what they do, which is going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to that. But it's this, it's this wow factor of information. You know, like dogs... They're breeding dogs. Here, like, here's a, a factoid. We're, we are breeding dogs to the point where the dogs are ill. Little pugs, with, they've got all, uh, most of them have trouble breathing. So now they've got an operation which takes away the flap here and gives the soft tissue here, and they've got an operation to make it possible for them to breathe. To, to breathe. And we're breeding them. We're not stopping. We're not saying, oh, we're going to breed the pugs anymore. We've got... Bulldogs. Bulldogs can't come through the, the birth canal because their heads are too big. They're breaking them. It's, it's moronic. And we're doing it. So that's what this book kind of got me going on. So I spent the afternoon with a book on dogs, and I've come to this conclusion. The morons that we are, because I've got two purebred dogs here. Uh, you know, we, there, the number of breeds that have happened in this last 50 years it far exceeds any of the breeding of the AKC breed uh, prior to that. It used to be, you know, a wolf came around and ate something and, and hung around for more, and then it became a wolf dog, and, and just it was around. And, and that's what dogs should, should be, according to the dog, rather than these, I mean, they're dogs, collies, that their narrow skulls are too tight for their brain, for the brain, and they and they suffer seizures immediately put down because they're 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 they're, they're snout and forehead are too narrow for the amount of brain that nature is putting in there. Um, we actually have a question from Bess, who asked, "What kind of dog is your dog, Macchiato?" Well, Macchiato and Espresso. <laughs> uh, whose father was Starbucks, who lived with me for 15 years, and he's buried in the backyard under a fruit tree. Um, so they're four years old, and they're uh, beautiful, beautiful dominoes. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, they're they're just they're they're gorgeous. They their their beauty, all everything is beautiful. But some people and animals to our eyes has more symmetry, perhaps, 
if that's what the definition of beauty is. So these dogs are very symmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question uh, from Marita, in, uh, who's in Germany, and uh, she's, this is for both uh, you and Josh. Uh, how long did the authors work on the book, and when did they know it was finished? Because it seems like a book that that's a really good question. Never ending uh, inspiration. Josh, I'll rely on your uh, memory. How long did we work on it? Uh, on and off, probably about nine months. And then when did we know it was finished? Uh, this is a great question, and this, this to me is so emblematic of, of Bill's can't stop, won't stop attitude. I handed in um, the, the draft that he and I had finished, and then we were, you know, privately each proofreading it and looking at it and making sure everything was correct. And Bill called me and said, um, there's more, isn't there? And I said, well, this, this is what we've written. He said, no, no, there's got to be more. And then the next day, he got an invitation, or I don't know if it was the next day, but he got an invitation with, uh, when we were talking with Ben Folds to go perform at the Kennedy Center. And we talked to the publisher and we said, is there room for an epilogue? And they said, yes. So we, we waited until then. And Bill went and did this amazing concert with the National Symphony. And then we, we had a couple, and, and I was there and we talked about it. And then afterwards we met and we, we got together and wrote this epilogue. And, and the epilogue fits, fits smoothly with the beginning of the book. Right. You know, the beginning of the book talks about how this first album was laughed at uh, for amusing circumstances. And then the epilogue is this incredible reaction of uh, 2,000 people in the concert hall of Kennedy when I, when we did, uh, when I performed these songs that uh, Robert Chernow and I had written, uh, and the 70 piece orchestra accompanying me. And the, the last song was about my journey into space. We call it So Fragile, So Blue. We wrote about that as the last chapter. But what's gone on since then is a company by the name of Legion M is going to represent the, the visual and the, uh, and the actual, the audible. Uh, the, uh, the the album will we'll probably be given to the London Symphony, but the visual will uh, be a television show, and from that, and here's the message: we're extracting a music video, so fragile, so blue, in my depths of my fevered imagination, will be the next. We are the world. The song echoes again and again, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? And I would get, we would get various well-known people to echo, what can we do, what can we do? To me, it's like a calling. It's like the next chapter of rallying grassroots people and have the people of Florida vote for uh, uh, expenditures on, on global warming. Very inspiring. Uh, now, this is good for people who, you know, people who are coming to just by themselves. Because uh, Patricia has asked, she, she doesn't know, she understands the format of the book. Is it a series of experiences that brought thoughtful epiphanies? Or is it done by time, like the last few years, or from youth? Because uh, apparently she was a camera operator on uh, Shit Your Dad Says, and found Mr. Shatner to be one of the hardest working committed actors she's ever worked with. Um, Josh, why don't you answer that? Yeah, please. And can I just, off the back of that, I also met Bill for the first time because of my dear friend Jonathan Sadowski, who played Bill's son, and it's just one beautiful connection. Well, I mean, look at the symmetry of that. Yeah. You know? the, the the camera operator, his friend who played the role, the thing. That it's just it's it's more than just coincidence. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, and and I echo that because I worked on a TV show called Haven, and Bill did the last four episodes we did, and I remember having a conversation with his assistant Kathleen, who called the office and said, uh, Bill wants to know if there are going to be any revisions for the next two scripts. And we said, oh, maybe maybe a couple. And she said, okay, because he's already learned all. So yeah, I can attest to that. No one works harder. But to answer the question, 
it's a series of essays, so it is not chronological. There are moments in the last chapter that, that touch on Bill's youth. There are moments in earlier chapters that touch on what he's been up to. Chapter four is where he goes to space, which is obviously one of the most recent things. So it really is about themes and then drawing past experiences into those themes. And for those of you, you make sure to, uh, in the chat, and we'll post it again, but it's in there, so make sure to buy the book. Um, and uh, we have a question here from Michelle Fisher um, for Mr. Shatner. Uh, particularly having a Jewish upbringing, have you ever read uh, the books in the Bible that are about wisdom and its origins? And how has Judaism modeled who you are today? No, I haven't read the Bible in its entirety. <clears throat> I have not. Uh, it's something I've always thought about doing, but I was trying to get past those begats. And uh, <laughs> with a lot of them. <laughs> a lot of begats. Uh, so I get a synopsis. <laughs> um, the way my Judaism has uh, molded me was that I was at, I, as a kid, I went to public school, uh, and for those beginning grades, first to, through eight, uh, I, the, the, there were the, I don't think there were any other Jewish kids there, so they picked on me a lot for being Jewish, and I got into fights every day, and I was, I was just fighting for my life for, for many years, and. I sort of had an insight into all those Jewish people who were incarcerated in ghettos and then went on to the terrible camps in Nazi Germany. After being told so often, you Jew, you dirty Jew, it must be like being black and saying, you're useless, you're black. And you, you fight, and you try and, uh, you know, try and uh, fight against it. But is there a time when you've fought back all your life, when the thought that I know it that happened to me, maybe it's true, maybe I'm a dirty Jew. And I thought the people in the camps, in the Holocaust camps, You know, the, the, the phrase dirty Jew came about because a lot of Jews in the ghettos were dirty because they didn't have adequate bathing, adequate water, adequate food. They were locked. There's a, I was in Lithuania before the COVID thing, and I saw the bricked up ghetto right on the major square of Vilnius. And I thought, my God, there are people lying underneath all that dirt were called dirty Jew, and they were, they were dirty. Because circumstances didn't allow them to cleanse themselves. And the Bible wants you to be clean. But if there's no water, no soap. So, being Jewish in Montreal in those years, not now so much, it was, it shaped a lot of me. And this album that I had out that you can get on Spotify and all those places, there's a song called Tutty. That's what they called me, Tutty, because I was fighting every day. And I had to hear the song Tutty in one of the interviews I've been doing today. And it just brought me back. It's, it's a, Bill is an album that has been in existence now I don't know, a year. And it uh, has gotten reviews like Sensational. Uh, and um, and uh, breathtaking, and so I'm hopeful that that album will be appealing, and the next album of the performance in in um, uh, Kennedy Center will also be equally appealing. Wow. Um, here's a another. We're going towards the end here. Um, and this is a this we'll have, we have maybe one or two more questions. This is a big one uh, from uh, Jose Francisco. Um, what do you think happens after we die, considering what you said about being part of the universe? 
Well, I, I don't think there's any question. I think the facts bear us out that we become part of the universe. Our, our stardust that we're made of goes back into nature. I know for me, I have in my will, I want to be cremated, uh, put in the earth and a tree planted on top of me. I want to nurse a tree, a redwood. Mm. And wrote a song, I want to be a tree, which is in the concert at, at um, Kennedy Center. So nobody knows, obviously. We, we certainly go back to being part of the universe. But whether our ability to be alive uh, for that moment, uh, conscious, whether we survive death in some manner that we would recognize, I think the chances are very slim. Hmm. Now, um, as we wrap up, uh, you had mentioned uh, that there was talk of, uh, of uh, another book after. Are, are, are you looking at, at, at another book in relation to this or another? Well, no, no, no. I, I think the, I want to, I, I would do another book and go to all the, you know, the time that we spend on another book if I could write this book about courage and fear, having to do with the people I've met and had some contact with their lives. I've got enough of them, I think, to warrant, you know, the equivalent of profiles in courage, but doing it my way. And Joshua, for you, do you have another pro? Yeah, I uh, wind up. I, if I, I would love it. it if I would love it if Josh joined me in the next book. And and I would be honoured. And uh, just just a quick plug, if I may, while I'm here, my first ever film as a writer director, A Thousand Little Cuts, came out this year on Showtime, and I hope everyone has a chance to see it. Excellent. But then right back to work with Bill. Fantastic. Um, well, the the seven o'clock time now, and um, as we wrap up, uh, Mr. Shatner, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, do you have any parting words for uh, the fans and avid readers that are are watching you right now? Well, I, I, we're we're so uh, the word honored. We're so grateful that you spent your time with us. Uh, uh, you've got a lot of other things to do, and the fact that you spend an hour of your precious time with us is is, is uh, relished, and I look forward to another time uh, of spending more time with y'all. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, Joshua, William Shatner, thank you so much for being here. Um, you can find Josh uh, on, on Twitter. I just uh, uh, put his handle in the... Um, in the chat there for everyone to see. Uh, you can go to williamshatner.com and get all the great information, keep up to date on all the amazing music that you're coming out and the concerts that will be happening. Um, and make sure to please buy the book, Won't We Go. Um, once again, Joshua, Mr. Shatner, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. You did a delightful job. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, thank you for coming. Josh, goodbye. Bye, <laughs> See you tomorrow. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, from Book Soup. Have a wonderful night. Please continue to support independent books. Good night.